I'm Julie Pavlin. I'm just going to take a minute of your time um, to welcome you and to thank you so much for coming online and in person. I'm the director of the board on global health um, at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And great to be back out here in person having uh, these discussions with, uh, with such a, an incredibly brilliant audience and speakers. Um, just two seconds on the National Academies and how we exist. So in 1863, Abraham Lincoln set us up. If you're here in the building, you can walk around. There's a, a painting, that, a stylized pi picture of, of him and the others that set up the National Academies. And it was to give advice to the nation and also to convene people together to talk about important scientific topics of the day, which is what we're doing um, right now. And, but Abraham Lincoln is a really smart guy, and, and he mandated us to exist through con congressional law. We're mandated to exist, but we're not given, we're not part of the federal government. We are 501c3, nonprofit independent. And he did that, of course, because if the government is giving advice to the government, um, no one's going to actually believe it. So <laughs> we are independent. But that also means that we do everything um, with external funding, and we get sponsors to, do, to talk about important topics like this. So I really wanted to thank we had many, many sponsors that came forward and, and really helped with this. Um, they're in the briefing book, but just uh, want to mention them. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Anaviv Life uh, Sciences, the California Healthcare Foundation, Cure Drug Repurposing Collabor Collaboratory, F2G, Fortress Biotech, MiraVista Diagnostics, Mycovia Pharmaceuticals, um, Nielsen Biosciences, and the Valley Fever Americas Foundation. They all came together and, and made this happen, and so I, I can't thank them enough because we can't do it without support like that. Um, we have, oh, about 70 or so people registered here um, in person, another 20 or so on our, our Zoom for our speakers, and then we had 600 people register online to attend, and so never get quite all that many that, that actually do, but um, it's also going to be online afterwards. If, if you have partners and, and colleagues that would be interested in um, probably in a two or three weeks, it will be up online as long, uh, along with slides and everything else on our website for free, and we will also be coming out with the proceedings um, in a few months that will... Um, summarize the discussions we're having here today, and those are, again, freely available to, to download online. Um, I want to thank also the planning committee. I know they have a day job, so thank you all to the planning committee. Round of applause for them. This is amazing. And, and I want to thank my staff here. Liz uh, Ashby has directed this. Um, she's, she took it over and just has been running with it. Did a great job. And then uh, Julie Lau, Justin Hamberberg, Emily Ryan Castillo, Claire Biffle, um, here today, and then we have Hannah Goodtree and Emma Rooney and Holly Leho um, back in D.C. You're actually helping us saying, hey, the, the sound's out, <laughs> something's going on. So we're um, working all that behind the scenes as well. So thank you all so much for being here, and I will turn it over and not take up any more of your time. Thank you. Okay. I'm John Galgiani, and I am the moderator for our next session, Disease Impact. And our first speaker today will be Chanel Damon, who is Acting Public Health Director across Navajo Area Indian Health Service. And her topic is um, COXI and indigenous populations, and she'll be doing this uh, remotely. So, Chanel. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yat a she Chanel Damon Yanshia, Ashinhe Yenshla, Belagana Bashishin, Turjini Dajache, Belagana Dajanella, Nejia Sana Ade Nasha. Hello, good afternoon. I am Chanel Damon. I am born for the Salt Clan into the White Clan, and that's how I introduce myself as a Navajo woman. I would like to uh, let you know that I will pre be presenting, like he said, on Coxidia Mycosis uh, within the Arizona like indigenous population. And I do work for the Navajo Area Indian Health Service as the Acting Public Health Director. So just to provide some context and background to our tribes in Arizona, uh, we have 22 federally recognized tribes and over 300,000 uh, people identify as American Indian in the state of Arizona. And under certain treaties, uh, we are, um, you know, by the, under certain treaties from the United States, our health care and some of our regular rights are um, provided under those certain treaties in exchange for the land. 
So um, here you'll see a map of Arizona, and I just want to draw uh, your attention to certain reservations that uh, you know that are living endemically to where Coxie like is always around. So um, I am from the Navajo Nation. This is my service unit, Navajo area. Here uh, we have our Hopi tribe in there that is in the middle of our reservation. And then we have White Mountain Apache, which is in Gila River or Gila County and, so, um, and San Carlos Apache. And then also this other big geogra geographical location, the Tona Autumn Nation. These guys are near Tucson and the Pasquayaki tribe. They're all here. They're all in the area where, you know, Coxie lives. And then also here we have Kokopa and the Quichon tribes. And then up here uh, we have Fort Mojave and California River Indian tribe. So I just wanted to bring some of those tribal areas into context here so you know where we are geographically. So in Phoenix, it's Maricopa County, and you'll also see a lot of little small tribes in the area. So Salt River, Pima Maricopa, Gila River, and at one time Gila River, Salt River, and Tona Otto were one tribe, and then they migrated up towards the, um, the Phoenix area. So I work for the Indian Health Service, and uh, we provide, you know, health care to American Indians. They also can access health care through other uh, hospitals and health clinics, depending on their uh, financial uh, accessibility and probably their insurance. And so a lot of people, and I especially, still go to an Indian Health Service just do out of comfort and also, um, because I uh, grown up in the in the Indian Health Service, that I don't mind getting my health care there. So we're also working on changing the way we, uh, you know, serve our patients, and we're always looking to recruit and sustain health professionals. And you know, if you're ever interested, and I didn't want to like make this negative or anything like that, because we always are looking for funding, of course. And a lot of times we're in areas that are geographically isolated, that it's hard to recruit um, health professionals. But I uh, just wanted to put it out there that we definitely are interested um, in uh, recruiting. So if you ever want to look for us and work for us, let me know. Also, uh, we uh, to sustain and uh, you know offset the funding that we don't receive fully, um, we. We do bill Medicaid and Medicare and then HMOs to increase our revenue at the Indian Health Service and tribal facilities. So like I said, our, our, our people, uh, they can go to private sector, they can come to our uh, facilities, they can go to tribal, and we all try to, like just a regular place, bill insurances. So I'm going to the next. So this thing skips to the next slide. Okay, hold on. So for some reason, when I use that presentation mode, okay, for some reason when I skip, it skips to some slide. So I just wanted to let you know that, you know, our American Indian, our indigenous communities, we definitely uh, rank ourselves with poor health status than most American Indians. And this is from the BRFSS surveillance system, the national survey. And uh, I just wanted to give you context about, you know, how we are um, physically. And then sometimes we have, we rank ourselves or we have physical limitations. We definitely have, you know, um, a high rate of obesity. Uh, smoking is kind of a norm in some of our communities. We have high rates of asthma, and then we have, of course, high rates of diabetes and then substance abuse. And these are just factors that, you know, I wanted to bring to the forefront, but we also have protection factors. And these factors have kept us here since, you know, the, um, for years and years before we were colonized and now years and years after the colonization. So we definitely have, and I, I always want to say this, a great, uh, you know, a great background in family, language, traditions, and just our culture in general. 
and being, uh, you know, being able to speak some words, being able to connect with community and family is a big, big uh, protective factor for all of us um, on the reservation and with most of us, despite your ethnic background. Also, you know, participating in ceremonies this past weekend, uh, we had my little girl's coming of age ceremony. And so uh, we uh, definitely had a good time, you know, planning and implementing the ceremony. And then hopefully she walks away with, you know, that great memory. And then one thing that was always, you know, a, a big protective factor for us and our people was multi-generational homes. Uh, we keep our families tight together, but during COVID, the multi-generational homes did not help our families because we had young kids going back and forth into the home and then elders, you know, that were there and then they would get exposed to COVID. But in the past, that had been a really big pr protective factor for our elderly to live longer than um than what, than what we live now. And then just our connection with Mother Earth and the universe, prayers, um, you know, that deep respect for, for the land. And so that's where we get our blessings from and where we, um, you know, in the morning we get up with the sun, we bless ourselves with the earth. And so having that connection has also kept us here on this, um, on this earth for a little bit longer. So we fought through a lot. So everyone has been talking about Coxie. Everyone, um, just to give context again, uh, we all know that it's a fungus and that it's endemic in Arizona. So I'm only talking about the tribes in Arizona and I'm talking about the tribes in, in the area that I serve. And so you'll see that um, it definitely has people, our risk factors are more severe for the immunocompromised. And so uh, we saw during COVID how our immune systems as American Indians uh, did not hold up uh, as as compared to our other um, ethnicities. And then also we do have, you know, high incidence of diabetes. So therefore, coccidiomycosis definitely has a greater negative effect uh, within our people. So I was able to get this data from the Arizona Department of Health Services. And so you could see how the prevalence of coccidiomycosis was in 2020. Um, I think that, you know, COVID has, we have not been able to go forward to get more data, but you can see here, this is where our, or I'm from, the Navajo area, the Navajo area Indian Health Service is on the Apache and Navajo area. And um, in there we have like close to hundred cases. And then right here again, like I had said, uh, Gila is uh, San Carlos Apache and White Mountain Apache. And then down here in Pima County, we had the Tona Atham Nation. And then of course, in the Maricopa County, we had all those little small tribes, Salt River, Indian Maricopa, Gila River. And then over here, we had Quachon, and then in the Cocopa, and then up here, Colorado River. So in these, there are some American Indians who have gotten Coxie in 2020. Um, it's not broken out until this page. So in 2020, out of all of those, 278 were identified or uh, were categorized and to the Native American um, race or ethnicity. And then you'll also see that makes up 2.4% of the population. And then just to go a little bit further, so... Uh, I was able to get some data from our Navajo Epidemiology Center and uh, the prevalence. He broke down and age adjusted it uh, from our data warehouse, from our data warehouse at the Navajo area. So here in 2018, uh, it's 9.02 per, per 10,000. And then again, it decreases from 19, 2019, 2020, 2021. And I could say we could all hypothesize that it decreased probably due to COVID. Like a lot of times our reporting systems during that time were all reporting COVID. Everyone was responding. So our data does not look good. So therefore, um, it doesn't give us a full picture of, of the prevalence of what and how coccidiomycosis may actually be really affecting 
my Navajo people or our Navajo people, and then the indigenous communities surrounding us. So the implications are, you know, uh, we, and when I was looking at the research regarding, you know, uh, toxicity mycosis, a lot of it had to do with uh, hospitalization. And, and the data was from 2010 to 2014, and it was actually from Indian Health Service. And in that data, it said we had the highest hospitalization rates for coccidia mycosis. And we also, you know, we missed a lot of diagnosis. So we missed a lot of diagnosis because they came in three, three months before and we probably diagnosed them as pneumonia. And, um, and from that, we missed the opportunity to actually treat, you know, our population. So from this, we also need to improve our surveillance. So right now you can see the numbers that I sent from the Navajo Epicenter. So when data flows from us, the Indian Health Service, pre-COVID, we would report to the state of Arizona, and then the state of Arizona would report to the Navajo Nation Epicenter. So it was like a circle there. Now that we have COVID and what and how we were able to get those numbers that you saw for the Navajo area, for the Navajo Nation, I mean, we were able to pull those data out of our Navajo Area Indian Health Service facilities, pull the data out, and daily dump it to the Navajo Epicenter for COVID. And so now we do that for all our infectious diseases. So now that we're able to, like, instead of, like, we still report to the state, but we immediately let the Navajo Epicenter know so that we as a, you know, a health department, as a public health infrastructure, we know what is going on in our community instead of having the state alert us sometimes and say, oh, you know, you're having an outbreak of coccidia mycosis or you're having an outbreak of, you know, foodborne diseases. So at the end of the day, we kind of fix, I mean, one, one silver lining from COVID, we were able to fix some of our surveillance systems. And there was another part where I'm only talking about the federal. So tribal, so what the tribe does, so say if you go to a clinic that's located on Navajo, but is not a federal facility, they, they still send to the state and report to the state. And then the state will return and report to the Navajo epicenter. And so there's a big lag in timing and data. It's due to like the demand of who's working and who's actually like sending those reports off. And with COVID, because we were daily dumping, we could actually say our, number, our numbers were really good. Then when um, some of our tribal facilities got behind, they weren't sharing the data, so we couldn't really say our numbers were really good. So we definitely need to improve surveillance and uh, getting the Navajo epicenter or the tribal health um, ep epicenters. There's, there's seven, I think, across the United States, getting them involved in that direct, you know, surveillance so that they get the numbers to just as fast as the state gets them. And we don't have that lag of like, OK, finally, we have an outbreak or somebody's putting it together and reporting it. Also, you know, the race. The race. So we've had like some really funny things happen. I think in the election, I think 20, was it 2018, they were like, okay, the majority of the voters from unknown or other <laughs> voted for, um, I think it was Biden or I'm not sure who it was, but it was a national election. And I think it was CDC or CNN that had reported it. This other or unknown is who like voted big time. And that unknown, are American Indians because when you take a survey, you have American, you have uh, whites, non-Hispanic, you have Hispanic, then you have African American, and then you usually have Asian, and then you have other. So we're the other, and that really needs to be fixed um, going forward with all our data that we're trying to collect. And sometimes two people are like, "Oh, well, maybe we don't want to know race," but we do. I would like to know. Uh, I don't think you know, making sure that we're classifying our race appropriately. So like, according to the data that I showed, there's only 278 cases out of all those cases in 2000 that were American Indian. Uh, but when you put it over our denominator, it's still a high prevalence, a high incidence rate. So it depends where those, um, you know, where those people were at and where, you know, how big their tribes are. So we've worked really hard on that. 
And then also just a number of like, you know, we see a high rate of American Indians hospitalized and then the deaths, like, you know, the comorbidities related to diabetes. We've seen that in the study that if you had diabetes and you got coccidiomycosis, coccidiomycosis, that you'll have a higher incidence for morbidity. So making sure that we're, um, we're really diagnosing our patients, right? And then at the end of the day, you know, what are our needs of those survivors? You know, usually there's long-term like healing that takes place. And then the biggest thing I think I've seen, so we all know about coccidiomycosis. We know it's a fungi. We know that it's in Arizona. We know it's in the four corners or we know it's in the Southwest, but we have yet like, you know, really message that, you know, it is in our area. We should be testing for it. Uh, we should definitely know what it is. And uh, we test our dogs. I feel like my dog's gotten tested more for coccidiomycosis than I ever have. Oh, uh, we're going to test this for this. And so we just definitely need to get more culturally appropriate messaging out our physicians, you know, instead of before, I think before COVID, it was a lot of unknown pneumonia and we missed the opportunity to actually diagnose people and, uh, you know, tailor their medication and their uh, healing process to them and their diagnosis. And then the prevention. Okay, so it's hard to prevent it because we live in this area, it's endemic, but just making sure we're messaging. I think that's what I actually kind of public health messaging um, that are appropriate, that's culturally relevant, that will allow the, you know, the the um, the community to know that this is here and I have yet to see that and we'll get working on it at our area. Um, but these are some of the implications that make it harder for us. And these are things that we can work together to fix. And so, um, like I said, making sure our surveillance systems are working together, uh, we're reporting and then communicating. So I just want to see if you guys have any questions. I know that there is an overall question and answers at the end. Um, so I'll be on standby. Thank you very much, Chanel.